very grateful. I'd like to thank the, uh, the organizers at ILSI and IFP for the opportunity to anchor the symposium this, after, this morning uh, and give our last presentation on uh, applications of whole genome sequencing for the Food Regulatory Agency of, of FDA and how we've been using the technology over the last few years as it has grown and become very powerful. Um, I certainly, I think uh, we can all agree that foodborne pathogens uh, are holding their ground. Uh, they're very difficult. Uh, the situation, as you can see from NJAMA from June, from our recent report from our CDC colleagues, uh, that in fact most of them are, are standing their ground pretty solidly and two actually increased. Salmonella, of course, among this list of thugs, Salmonella still tops the charts with the most number of illnesses among bacterial pathogens. So we focus heavily on that, as you can imagine, at the FDA and the Center for Food Safety. That's one of our arch banes that we combat. Uh, you might ask, why is it so difficult to track salmonella contamination back to its source if you can account for maybe 40 percent of all the contamination to about 10 of the highest uh, risk foods? And that's true, but many of these foods are often found in complex mixtures and other bread eat or processed foods that makes it much more challenging. Just a handful of recalls, um, seizures, and various other actions that were taking place out of our center over the last year or two. You can see it's a quite diverse array of, of food items uh, that salmonella has infiltrated, that's for sure. To make matters worse, uh, you we now know that among all the products that FDA regulates, food of course, is the most highly imported of, of all the commodities, uh, and not by just a little bit. Um, it's an extraordinary amount. Um, now we see upward of 10 million import lines of food per year coming into our country, uh, which also makes track, tracking and tracing back to source a very difficult challenge. Um, just to put that in perspective um, of some of the oversight that the Food and Drug Administration has over the food supply and how challenging that is, is that we really have 200,000 registered food facilities, 81,000 domestic, and more than 115,000 foreign registries and that, that serve directly into the food supply. We have more than 300 ports of entry where food enters the country, more than 130,000 importers, and 11 million import lines per year of food. And if you're wondering what an import line is, an import line can be as large as a convoy of merchant marine ships full of a single food item. So it's an extraordinary and daunting task. Uh, not to mention, in the U.S., we have more than two million farms producing food and putting it into commerce. So it's, an, it's a, quite a challenge. Uh, it, it's never boring, I'll say that. So about five years ago, um, when the director, Steve Musser, called me downstairs and said, um, I'd like you to explore how shotgun sequencing can enhance our abilities in the food safety lab for diagnostics and other reasons. And I said, hmm, shotgun sequencing? Well, being born and raised in West Virginia, I like the sound of it already. <laughs> so what can be bad if it's got a shotgun in it? So, so I find out actually over a number of... Uh, months that um, what it is is referring, of course, to massively parallel sequencing or what we just now call whole genome sequencing. You may hear it called next generation sequencing as well. Uh, and we implemented it in our laboratory in late 2008, but not with the idea that we would ever want to use this to track a foodborne outbreak back to its source, right? We bought whole genome sequencing to enhance our methods development program, to have new SNPs, new biomarkers, new targets, new fingerprinting methods. We, it held great promise as a data mining tool, and that was what we used it for, but not outbreak response, no. Until um, Jack Kazage, who was our head sanitarian and one of our lead epidemiologists in the center, came downstairs in early 2009 and said, there's kind of a difficult outbreak going on in New England right now. We think that uh, whole genome sequencing might provide the kind of resolution to tell us about what's part of the outbreak and what's not part of the outbreak. There were a number of food vehicles involved in the spiced meat outbreak in New England in 2009, and um, we were happy to throw our hat in the ring and, and give it a try. And in fact, we did, and um, this was the beginning of our applications of the technology to support traceback 
uh, and source attribution, also to support the Office of Compliance and our outbreak response teams. Um, I did actually come to IFP uh, at the end of 2009 uh, from an invite from Dr. Donald Zink uh, when we were very excited about this new technology. And I had a little bit of data, uh, told a bit of a story about it. Uh, it was all still very tentative. It was very new. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, we've come a long way since then. So it's my first time back to IFP. And now, of course, we're talking about national and global networks and um, moving forward at a federal level, at a state level, at local levels. It's all exciting, and I'm so delighted that we've all moved together. Um, next generation sequencing, we now know, answers three very important questions about contamination events. It tells us if we've seen an isolate before, which is very important. It tells us if these isolates form a cluster, if they're part of an outbreak, or are they sporadic, or are they part of the background. And then we can easily link up similarities between food and environmental collections that our inspectors actually go out in the field and get with good old shoe leather, and the clinical isolates that are collected by the states and brought to the CDC uh, for an important comparison to look at the source and attribution of whether we found this thing that's actually making people sick. Um, certainly, I know in response to the questions that came before about cost and deployability, um, I think I couldn't be more excited with how quickly the, tech, the cost of the technology is rock bottoming. Uh, it's actually going in the ways of VCRs. I'm old enough to remember when we got the first VCR at the house. The VCR cost $700. In, in mid 1970s salaries, that was a lot of money. And now VCRs, if you can find one, are $10. And uh, we are going the way of VCRs and microwaves here, I have no doubt. So the cost is coming down. We were at about $75 a genome using the MySeq technology. Right now, we've brought in two NextSeqs, which allow a little higher throughput in the laboratory. We can now run about 120 strains simultaneously at 40x coverage. And coming off a full machine, that's less than $40 a genome coming off the next seat. And that's, that's actually getting down in a range where it's almost as cheap as a disposable test. So it's, it's really coming down in price. Uh, what we love about whole genome sequencing uh, is the um, flexibility of taking all the data, using it to answer the questions you need to ask, ranging all the way from species, from strain, down to a clonal lineage, uh, or an outbreak isolate, uh, or delimiting these scopes. And so uh, for us, um, you have an extensive amount of flexibility with the data. Uh, we're going to move in different directions with drug resistance, which you've already heard about, virulence profiling, uh, serotyping, uh, and all these great offshoots that whole genome sequencing will lead the way on over the next few years. Um, for us, if you take an outbreak and dissect it in three sections, uh, from detection, and this particularly for salmonella where serotype is very important, you go from detection to serotyping to subtyping. Certainly for detection, we still rely on some of our conventional methods, our qPCR-based techniques, uh, but as we move quickly down into the typing realm, um, we're looking to whole genome sequencing now to already uh, get us there in terms of finding out what kind of salmonella is it? Is it a serovar that's part of the outbreak? And if so, is it actually part of the strain or is it the strain that's causing the outbreak? And so, so for us, um, whole genome sequencing is really revolutionizing the way we do business. Um, in fact, we have a few applications. Some are just getting off the ground. Some have been in place now for a few years. Um, of course, delimiting scope and trace back for food contamination events, what my bosses like to call Eric's track and trace budget. Uh, track and trace is a big application for us, and you've heard about it all morning. It's huge. Uh, quality control is something we didn't realize we'd have in whole genome sequencing. Being able to know whether we have a real positive, a real negative from our microbiological testing programs is absolutely critical. Uh, preventive control monitoring for compliance standards, looking and finding those sporadic illnesses that would have leaked through using less high, lower resolution technologies. Um, and then, of course, all the other phenotypic and epigenetic markers you can harvest, including ID, genotype, phenotype, AST, serotyping, virulence profiles. Uh, all this feeds into risk assessment. All this feeds into teaching us more about the biology of salmonella that we totally did not know. 
Um, it's really extraordinary. Uh, if you get a chance, we'll get more into this. I'm going to get a little more into some of these examples uh, at the Big Data Symposium after lunch. Um, and then finally, of course, as, as um, Dr. Braden pointed out, uh, metagenomics, as Peter pointed out, metagenomics is really going to be the final place where we converge to actually get all these sequence data directly out of a food or a patient or something like that. So we're on our way. And uh, as I always like to say, you can't say metagenome without saying genome. So we have to lay the base first and build the database. Uh, this a quick example of showing how quality assurance is revolutionized by it. Um, we don't want false negatives. False negatives are very bad. It means that we might have let a contaminated food into the food supply that could make someone sick. However, false positives are bad too. False positives can damage industry. And we don't want to go destroying product if in fact the product did not have a pathogen in it. And so this is why these QA checks are so very important. Here's an example of a collaborating testing lab where we were working with them. We found out that they had an isolate of salmonella. Uh, we found out over a 60-day period that they were re-isolating the same salmonella, but from multiple different food sources from multiple different parts of the world. This was a red flag for us showing that you would see way more than two SNPs between these isolates. This must be a laboratory contamination issue, and it opened our eyes to it. A second example, we had a, an isolate that came up positive in the produce supply, an E. coli. Uh, we found out that when we went back and looked at the control isolate that was being used by the laboratory, that in fact it almost was indistinguishable by whole genome sequencing to four other control standards of the same strain used in four different test laboratories around FDA and in our food emergency response network. And so we were pleased to have this tool because we wouldn't want to make a mistake. We wouldn't want to pull food back when, in fact, the food probably was not contaminated. So had we not had the technology, we would have erred on the side of caution, of course. But with the technology, we can go in with our eyes open. Very extraordinary application, quite unexpected, actually, when we started. Uh, but of course, the great power, the bread and butter, has always been trace back, source attribution, and the relationship of those SNPs and how close they get you to the source. Darwin knew about this. He knew about it 150 years ago. Darwin said very clearly, he said, I know that uh, if we could get down into the genetics of these, these organisms, we'd find out that their inheritance will be betrayed, will always betray their birthplace. He knew it then, but he didn't have whole genome sequencing. So he couldn't get back that far. He couldn't go down to that level. Whole genome sequencing is getting us there. We've been able to use it, and we've shed light on the sources and contamination sources of many different outbreaks over the last three or four years. And this is just a list of some of the ones that we've been heavily involved in over that time period. So we're very happy about it. I have several real examples that I'd be happy to share with you after lunch. Uh, but of course, I have other things I have to get into. So much to say, so little time, right? Uh, but the one thing I want to say that we are very proud of, and this is related to our collaboration with, with CDC on the Listeria Real-Time Project, was related to the Mexican-style cheese outbreak that we worked on this past spring. In this case, um, as Peter pointed out, we had a queso-style cheese that was positive for Listeria monocytogenes. Um, the clinical cases were brought in, sequenced in Atlanta. Uh, because they upload the data, to the database, we were able to quickly pull it down in real time as during the follow-up and assistance with our Office of Compliance uh, looking for the source. We then had isolates of our own collected from the Roos facility uh, in the Mid-Atlantic. We added that to the actual food isolates from the Mid-Atlantic states where product was actually purchased and made people sick. And we got a really nice slam dunk uh, phylogenetic tree of the whole genome sequences showing that it linked up the clinical, the food, and the plant itself uh, in less than five SNPs. And so this was extraordinary for us. We were very delighted to have it go forward as a, for a first example of a regulatory action that had included whole genome sequencing as part of the investigation. This is the actual letter from Margaret Hamburg to Roos Foods using her newly invested powers from FISMA to actually suspend the registration of Roos Foods in the United States. And uh, we were all just could not be more proud. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, whole genome sequencing now, we believe, is ready for a distributed level of analysis. It's time to get it out. 
Uh, this is why in fall of 2013, we set up the genome tracker. Uh, it's our initial pilot study, which we believe could be the starting source for a whole genome sequence-based food shield for the United States, uh, certainly in collaborations with CDC, with the National Institutes of Health at NCBI who helped curate the data. Uh, we think we're going to get there quickly, for sure. Um, the genome tracker strategy is that we take this distributed sequencing network and we make sure that we can do whole genome sequencing analysis, data movement, and data compilation and curation, all from remote sources around the country and, and all in as close to as a real time as could be done. And, um, and so this required partnerships, of course. Partnerships are the best way to go. With NCBI serving as storage and curation site, uh, anybody who can curate that much data uh, would, it would almost be impossible. It would be cost prohibitive. Uh, Jorgen gave a great example today. He said, you know, are we all going to try to build databases from scratch or can we use time-tested databases to curate? And clearly NCBI has been doing this since the late 80s. It's their job to do it and it really helped us. This is a model of what we see as the genome tracker moving forward. It includes federal laboratories moving data from and to NCBI, state, local, and foreign public health labs, as well as industry and academia for methods development and for any other research questions that they want to work on. Um, and, uh, and so we have basically these machines, these engines of sequencers that are running. Um, we have seven in SIFSAN that are running full time and feeding into the genome tracker database. Uh, and I was really delighted to hear Dr. Braden say a moment ago that much of that data has gone into the surveillance model as well and is linking up clinical and food and environmental cases. So that's the whole point. That's what it's all about, is getting that data up there and using it. So what do the key elements of a national network look like? You got three points. You got labs that have to be the engines to generate the data. In a, in a distributed model, everybody can get a MySeq and start sequencing their own isolates fairly quickly. You've got sequence storage, data provision, and some preliminary analysis. And you've got network management. And of course, that means triaging strains, keeping your own local management system going. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work to do that. Each one of those things costs money. And so we feel that it might be a good idea to start moving resources to where we can make a difference. So to do that, we look to NCBI, EBI, and EMBL, and the Asian database to do those real-time storages and curations of the whole genome sequence data, I'm happy to say free of charge to this point, which is good for us. That, of course, frees up a whole lot more money for us to sequence a whole lot more strains. And that's kind of the model we're going on right now at FDA. This is the Genome Tracker Network. It has our nine federal field regional laboratories all fully equipped and sequencing right now salmonella and listeria real time. We've got six or seven state laboratories involved, Washington, Arizona, Minnesota, Florida, Virginia, New York, and Maryland. Maryland's our honorary member. They actually had the technology as far back as we did. And uh, since they're only about 20 minutes from our building, uh, we, we thought it'd be good to get to know our neighbors and start working together pretty quickly. So uh, very, very good group. Uh, working very hard and moving forward sequencing. Uh, all the data is moving up to NCBI where the data is housed and curated um, with a minimal metadata set associated with that, something that does not uh, cross IP, does not cross patient privacy, things of that nature, and certainly does not cross industry's uh, privacy, which of course we always respect. Uh, and, and we also, are, the question came up about open source versus open data. Um, we have now published our SNP analysis pipeline. It is open to the public uh, to repeat and other places around the world. And you can go online and you can see how the data is analyzed. You can see what matrices we've used and what algorithms we use to do so. So everything's up there and everything's fully transparent. Uh, we know there's a lot of questions. You've heard it all morning. We know there's a lot of hurdles still. And this is just an example of a few of the big ones. How are we going to share it all? Who owns the IP? Who oversees it? How much metadata? Big questions, not going to be solved overnight. Jorgen made it clear, these, he framed these issues too. GMI is working hard at a global level to try to answer some of these, and we're trying to help out, at least in the U.S. at our local level, to feed into that. 
And so that's, those are all very important things. And we're not going to be stopped by it because we can't wait. Like Jorgen said, we're not going to wait five years. We're moving. We've been moving. So we partnered. We have partners around the world already. Denmark, the United Kingdom, some in South America. Ireland has been a great partner. Some contribute isolates. Some have acquired sequencing technology and are starting to sequence food and environmental isolates, among other things. So um, the partnerships have started and the collaborations are working great. Uh, and we hope to keep building them as we move forward. So where do we go from here? I think uh, now we've, we've got more than 17 different examples of where whole genome sequencing can help pinpoint the source in conjunction with a good pinpointing from epidemiological investigation, some good shoe leather from investigators. Whole genome sequencing is a powerful tool that can get you back to source. We've got 17 different examples from our own laboratory where it works. Um, it's reliable, it's very efficient, and it's starting to do a great job of giving a specificity, phylogeographic specificity, which it turns out Salmonella has a lot of. It's very geographically structured. We sequenced more than 4,000 Salmonella that we've got uploaded in the database, more than 1,400 Listeria, and close to 100 closed genomes from our Pacific Biosciences program in the laboratory have all been uploaded to GenBank and to NCBI. The genome tracker across its state and federal network is generating about 400 genomes per month. And um, we just want to keep that going. We want it to go up. And um, we know the importance of food and environmental isolates because for all those clinical isolates, you really want to see if they're linked back to source, if you can find that source. And so the food and environmental data will be important and be rich and robust to any database as we move forward, and that's our contribution. Um, we've got a lot of requests from other public health labs, from agricultural laboratories in the country and around the world who have a lot of rich isolates and government, and especially industry. We don't want to overlook industry because this will directly affect industry. And I think it's important to point out perhaps some of the, the, the areas where this could actually mitigate industry's efforts to continue to supply safe foods to the United States. And that is, if you have contaminations with common PFGE patterns, you may not be able to find out where in the distribution chain your problem lies. Whole genome sequencing, um, we called it in 2009 in the JAMA article that we published, we called it nanotyping. I still like to call it nanotyping because it gets you down to that level. And so with nanotyping, you can pinpoint specific farm suppliers. You can exonerate remaining networks areas of your supply chain. Very important for industry. Um, in multi-ingredient processing facilities, you can start to distinguish between whether or not you've got an endemic contamination problem where you keep seeing the same isolate recur again and again, or whether you really have some feral problem with incoming ingredients. You'll be able to know using this level of nanotyping at your fingertips. And then thirdly, don't forget, there's always going to be this public reference database that anybody from industry or anywhere else can tap into at any time they wish, download the data, and do a comparison of your isolates with the public reference database to see if you have any isolates that link to any human illnesses, any isolates that link to a particular food source, a particular geographic region around the country. You can learn a lot. And so real-time analysis is going to continue to get us there. So here's the vision, here's the model. The fresh cut supply chain is an example I like to use of a complicated distribution pattern. This is clearly one that um, I like to set up there that would benefit greatly from whole genome sequencing. You put sequencers in various points in the supply chain, you'll be back to that farm source a lot quicker. And this afternoon, I'm actually going to show the full example of where we were able to trace back in a tomato event back to the source pretty quickly. So that would be the model there. So points to recall. Whole genome sequencing is really changing the lab, the face of the laboratory. It's changing, it's uh, making huge contributions to public health, outbreak investigations, food safety definitely included. Whole genome sequencing will mitigate tracebacks and delimit scopes of contamination events unlike ever before with numerous offshoot applications like compliance standards, quality assurance, and things of that nature. Uh, international open source and open data databases will empower whole genome sequencing for the kind of sentinel surveillance work that it's meant to do. And I was, I'm so delighted that our colleagues in Atlanta at the CDC are moving forward with it, 
and they're getting a lot of rich information back as well for their surveillance needs. We're continuing to deploy this for applied food safety investigations. We will continue to support our Office of Compliance and our outbreak response teams, and we are now developing metagenomic and next-gen applications to try to identify foodborne pathogens directly from foods using next generation or shotgun sequencing. So hopefully we'll get there in the next five years or so. We'll see. Genome sequencing, the best thing about them is they're agnostic, which means it's okay if you've got a MySeq, it's okay if you've got an ion torrent. Someday you may even have an Oxford nanopore that fits in the palm of your hand and plugs in like a flash drive into your laptop. We're beta testing that right now. So it doesn't matter which platform in the end. The important thing is that you collect the data, you collect it at high levels and get good quality uh, sequencing done and get it into the database. Uh, we're gonna keep deploying it and we are basically um, gonna move forward as best we can with the resources we have to try to support both our own programs, our, federal, our other federal colleagues' programs, and the states and local authorities, which are the boots on the ground that this gentleman over here pointed out, which, which we're happy to. So um, I hope I didn't take too much time, but I want to tell you how very excited we are at FDA about the technology and about what we've been able to do with it. There are so many people to thank. It truly is a village when it comes to genomics of food safety. And uh, again, I want to thank you for your time.